The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am Matt Karst, Marketing Specialist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Uh, you probably recognize my voice from the Q&A of most webinars. I have never been on camera nor introduced one before, so bear with me. We'll give this a shot. Um, just to touch base real quick, our commitment to education during COVID-19. Uh, during these unprecedented times, we know you've been making adjustments to your organization. Our commitment is to continue to support you with plant healthcare science and education that will help your organization continue to grow. Today's webinar is a Q&A panel sharing practical experience for tree injection operations and running production crews. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Make sure you do a safety assessment around you. If, they're, if you're working in an office, make sure you are aware of any cords, trip hazards, have a safety plan in case of fires or inclement weather. Um, this is a, gonna be a Q&A process. So when you registered, we asked you to submit any questions you would have for our speakers. Um, you, do feel free to add in any questions if they come up during it. We'll try and answer them as they are relevant. If not, we'll address a lot of those at the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and the video link will be sent out after about a couple hours, uh, about a day after. Um, and if you are looking for ISA certifications, uh, we put a lot of these together uh, pretty quickly and ISA has a 30 day turnaround for pre-approved CEU. So this one will have to go into post-approval. So we'll send out the directions in a post email on how you apply for those and submit through them. And today's presenters, Paul, I think you can probably do it better with us. He is our injection foreman at Rainbow Tree Care on our services side, and he runs uh, quite a bit of crew. So I'll let him do a little bit of an intro for himself. Yeah, I'm Paul Shonicky. I've uh, been with Rainbow for a little over 13, 13 and a half years. Uh, I started seasonally with Rainbow uh, doing injections uh, for elm trees and then uh, moved into uh, some of uh, all of our applications that we've done, uh, except for some of the pest expert stuff. And uh, I do climb from uh, fall, winter, and spring seasons and work, uh, work with quite a few uh, of the individual techs through our micro and macro uh, crews. Um, annually for trees that we do treat on rotation for elm trees, we're looking um, every three, well, for the three year uh, duration, we have about 3,000 or 2,500 to 3,000 elms under protection that are on rotation. For ash trees, it was our biggest year last year completing uh, almost about 24,000 ash trees. Um, so for that, we have uh, quite a few technicians that uh, we train throughout the season. With uh, macro this year, we're uh, looking at about 15 uh, macro techs that are working full-time for us through the season. And then for the micros, we have right around 40 to 45 currently. And I believe we're in the process of adding a couple more. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over some general overview of our operations here in a little bit, but uh, we do have separate divisions for all of these as well. So the macro injections really focus just on elms and oaks, and we also incorporate some of the, the micro injection uh, for that with, uh, with two-line chestnut borer. And then the micro injections really stick to just the ash borer treatments. And then our PHC that does all the sprays and uh, ferts and stuff will have a separate division as well. So they have their own techs, which is right around 10 to 18 techs uh, kind of sporadically. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Paul. And our next presenter today is Allison Harrell. She is our arborologist for the Midwest Territories for Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, hi, I'm Allison Harrell. I think I have seen a lot of you on some of these webinars through the spring. Uh, like Matt said, I'm the Midwest Arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific, Ad Scientific Advancements. Um, I've got about 10 years of experience in the tree care industry, six of them as kind of a plant health care tech, three of those years specifically covering injections, um, and then also being cross-trained, kind of like Paul as a groundsman and a tree climber. Um, and then my last three years with a tree care company, I was working as a sales arborist. So have a interesting background um, and perspective, not being with Rainbow, but having, you know, similar background to Paul. So we're going to try to piggyback the things that Rainbow does that we can then apply to your businesses. Um, because I've started with Rainbow just over a year ago. And my primary focus now that I work here is to train and work with tree care companies around the Midwest 
So we're training on plant healthcare protocols and a lot of in the field training. So now I have had exposure to dozens of different tree care companies out there and I've seen kind of how their operations um, work as well as my experiences and then Paul's. And then just quickly to let you guys know, um, if you haven't had any hands-on trainings with us, please let us know if you have any interest. Um, we'd love to get you on our schedule. Uh, we also can do virtual trainings because I know traveling has been a bit difficult, so please reach out. And then lastly, I just want to highlight that this is the third part of our sort of macro injection webinar series. Um, we had a lot of questions come in this section around the applications, um, as Matt noted, and we're going to answer quite a few of them today. But we do want to focus on how to optimize your tree care injections and have some sales conversation discussion. Um, so if there's anything that doesn't get answered, please reach out, but also check out our website. We have a ton of training materials, a ton of recorded webinars, and a lot of other, a lot of other uh, information out there for you. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. So with that, let's jump right in and get started. So the, we've broken this down into three main sections. Uh, the first section here that we'll cover uh, deals mainly with injection best management practices. So starting off, what guidelines should be given to inexperienced crews in order for them to determine whether a tree is healthy enough to treat? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I, I stay heavily in contact with the uh, techs throughout the season. So when they come into a situation they're unsure of, uh, they call. Um, we have a, a tree uh, we have a tree set up basically for uh, calling and getting some answers. Uh, we train on the disease um, and what they. Uh, what it looks like and if they see something even close resembling the disease i have them call and then uh, they also uh, might get into trees uh, with either lots of dieback rotten punky root flares uh, where they have to you know eject above grade for the most of those trees uh, they call on those as well and then the arborist uh, the sales consultant will uh, throw some notes on the work order as well and you know if something is present uh, just kind of guiding them in reductions and to call if something doesn't look right Cool, yeah, and then from my perspective, uh, we help, so Rainbow, tree, Rainbow Scientific Advancements can definitely come in to help train you on the signs and symptoms of the disease and identifying Dutch elm disease, for instance. Um, so there's my first plug for RTSA. If you guys need us to help you with that, you can. We also do have the tech support line, so if you guys are ever confused and not sure if you should treat or not, feel free to send videos, video chat us, um, we would love to help you make sure that you're not treating a tree that you suspect is um, infected. And obviously that's because tracing would need to happen and that was outlined in our last webinar. All right. Bear with me while I'm going through. I'm gonna try and check for any questions as we go through this and I don't see any, so we'll move on to the next one. Can I pursue trunk injections when there are no leaves? Yeah, um, yeah. so it really depends on what application you're looking at. You know, for Dutch elm disease, you really want full leaf out. Uh, if heavy seed, if it's a heavy seed year uh, or season, uh, you might wanna wait until that uh, leaf has fully developed. Uh, for oak wilt, you should wait for full leaf expansion. Uh, bur oak blight, uh, you can inject after bud break and uh, leaf starts to, ex uh, starts to expand. Uh, for chlorosis, though, uh, you can inject that leaf when it's not present, but you want to do that before the root hardens off for the season. Anything to add, Allison? No, I'm good on that one. That's All right. Pretty clear. Move on to the next one. Uh, what are the best practices for young or small trees? Yeah, for us, uh, we try not to inject anything that are under 10 inches, um, but occasionally you will have to, uh, especially if you're dealing with like an oak wilt site, um, just to get that alum or the propiconazole into the root flare system to protect all the trees around there. Um, but yeah, generally um, anything, try to keep below grade. And, uh, you know, there is some where we do six inches and seven inches, depending on the, really depends on the situation. Yeah, additionally, it also depends on what application you're talking about. Um, so this is a little bit label dependent. There are some applications that you can treat for as little as four inches in diameter, and especially like with micro injection, um, that's okay. So I, I guess I don't have clarity on that specific question, but 
follow the labels. And then I, I think Paul saying for macro about 10 inches is the cutoff. All right. What PSI do I need to use? What is the reason for that range? Yeah, so I, I typically stay within 10 to 12 PSI. Um, this has really been the happy place uh, in most trees that I've found um, with the trees that I've injected. You know, too much pressure will result in teas popping. Uh, sites might start leaking or slowly start dripping. You know, a misconception is that more, you know, more pressure is faster uh, when in reality it actually slows down your injection time due to you know, some of the stuff above. So, um, you know, just remember, uh, we aren't trying to force this in, you know, to the tree to make it as fast as we can. You know, we're simply adding pressure to help with the process. Um, while it does help speed it up, ultimately the tree is doing most of the work. Yeah, so, I mean, 10 to 12 is good for you, Paul. I I feel like I sometimes can go up to 15 and have good success, but really exactly what you said, you're hoping to rely on the transpiration of the tree. You're not like jamming that liquid in there. So jacking up the pressure doesn't help the process. And then one thing to note, you're not necessarily just dealing with like small leaks. Sometimes those T's or those tubes will pop completely and you'll start to lose quite a bit of chemical. Um, so that actually can have, uh, you know, efficacy impacts if you lose enough product. So 10 to 15 PSI, I guess, would be my answer, but maybe that 12, 12 is like the sweet spot. Yeah, and then occasionally, too, if you have a really large elm tree, let's say, or an oak tree, um, your pressure can increase as well just to be able to deliver that product, you know, throughout the entire, you know, root flare, so. Right. How do I know my drill bit is dull? How often do I need to change my drill bit? Well, that's a that's another good question. You know, you may not. Um, it's for us. It's we just do a best practice as well, or a habit of changing our you know drill bit for every three to five trees. But um, one way you can also tell is you know the pigtails that come out, the pet, the shavings of your uh, injection site. Uh, if it's breaking apart and it's you know red and kind of punky and stuff, um, might not be a good injection site. And then also it's you know it's going to start cauterizing when you're doing that. So. Um, I, I err on the side of caution with that and with our training, we really focus on like, you know, three to five trees and uh, then we just switch them out. Yeah, that's kind of what we use as well, what all the companies around ideally use. Um, and just a quick note, like you may not be able to tell if your drill bit is dull, um, but you will be able to tell with uptake speed. Like you may not be able to tell by looking at it, but you will see a huge reduction in uptake speed if you're using old drill bits. So just make sure that you're changing them out. Make sure that you're using those high helix drill bits. You're really getting that nice surgeon-like cut uh, to get the best xylem for uptake. All right, what conditions should I avoid when doing trunk injections? Well, you know, it really depends on what you're injecting and for what, you know, for, for elms, 75 to 85 degrees, a nice breeze, 10 to 15 miles an hour, partly sunny. Um, you you want to avoid extreme heat. You know, trees tend to shut down with the excessive heat and humidity is present. You know, we start early on those days and end a little bit earlier. Um, oaks, you can do, you know, you can inject those in the rain. Um, light rain, heavy downpours are really no good for any injection, um, and especially for the tech. So. Yeah, well, Paul, wouldn't it be lovely if we could get 75 to 85 degree days with a nice breeze every day? Um, yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, ideally, nothing within plant health care uh, is great once we hit those 90 degree temperatures. And I understand that there are, you know, a variety of people who are on this call from different places in the country, and we're talking idealistic conditions. But if you can, you know, start those injections earlier in the day and, and kind of mitigate around any extreme temperatures, you're gonna have the best chances for success. Why is the root color area the best place to target trunk injections? Is there a reason I should avoid drilling higher? Yeah, uh, three, thing, three things here. Um, one, distribution, you know, the lower you go, uh, the better your distribution will have throughout the canopy um, because there's there's more meristemic tissue here, uh, therefore there's more lateral movement. Uh, number two, 
which leads into the second point, which is its great ability to compartmentalize those wounds. You know, above grade, it takes longer, which increases exposure to fungus and insect uh, pathogens. And then number three, you know, it makes finding the injection sites and drilling to the correct depth easier, uh, since you can expose that uh, smooth tissue. Yeah, and then just a quick note there, that, that's perfect, Paul. Uh, brush off that root flare, make sure it's nice and clean so you can, for all of those reasons, and yep. also in regards to the drill beds. Yes, yeah, and brushing it off will uh, save your drill bed too, so it'll, it'll keep it sharper longer. Do you do anything special or communicate to a homeowner before the service is completed to make your life easier or have faster uptake? You know, in the past, uh, we have suggested that they water their tree, uh, you know, a few days in advance of us showing up just to perform the treatment. And that just really helps with us uh, with the uptake. Yeah, I would say, especially knowing that you're doing all those injections in the summer, right? So it's like usually hotter and drier. That's not a bad um, thing to try to implement with your customers. Uh, but I guess the one thing I would mention, I deal with a lot of uh, companies who are dealing with municipal contracts and most likely you've bid those jobs super tight. So there wouldn't even be an opportunity for your crew to have enough time to go water those trees ahead of time, nor is there anyone who works for the city who would do that. So um, while that's great, know that that's also maybe not possible, but you could do the cost benefit for yourself, see if it's worth it, better uptake time, the time, you know, kind of weigh it with the time that I would take a tech to go water. Oh, and then, sorry, one more thing. I think generally in the industry with the communication with the homeowner, just letting them know when you're planning on coming. I know Rainbow has a whole big text slash email slash phone call, however their clients want to do it, but making sure they know that you're coming because you are on site for a while, making sure those gates are unlocked, um, and then knowing that you're going to be there for a bit, um, prepping them for that so it's not a surprise. It's kind of like all plant healthcare things, though. <laughs> What are the best practices for young, small trees? Oh, wait, did we already do this one? Sorry. Did you go back? I believe we did, yeah. Oops. Nope, must have it in there twice. Okay. So we'll go to the next one. <laughs> do you have a cutoff time you don't want to start new trees? Uh, yeah, you know, it really depends on the weather, uh, location of the tree, uh, but generally we have a last setup time. Um, in the beginning of the season, usually we set up between uh, our last year between 2 and 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, later in the season, around 3, 3.30. Um, that's, it, it really depends on the location of the tree sometimes, too. If that tree is in a great backyard spot or um, fenced off and stuff, we'll, uh, we'll hit that one last and then uh, the front yard boulevard ones sometimes tend to take a little bit longer um, due to injuries or uh, constriction. So we, we tend to hold off on those at the end of the day. Yeah, I would say this really just depends what time you want your crews in and how much overtime you want to pay them. Mm -hmm. What do I do if I have a slow elm or oak at the end of the workday? Yeah, so we prepare it for overnight. Um, you know, we we prep the site for overnights uh, when we get to that point. You know, usually we're looking at about 435. If the tree's looking like it's going to finish, um, the crew will stay out and, and with that tree and, and try to get that to finish up. Uh, but we do have trees that do sit overnight. And sometimes, you know, they, they go really good uptake. Some don't have good uptake. But for prepping the site, you know, for overnight, we'll unplug the power. We'll keep all the injection sites and equipment hooked up to the tree. Uh, we throw contractor bags over the entire uh, barrel to the ground covering the pump and tucking it in underneath the barrel. Um, then we'll, uh, we have these uh, yard signs that, uh, that we put in front of them, kind of like those painter signs that you see out there with the little wires. And they're about 12 by 16 uh, on stakes that we'll set right in front of the barrel. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with the homeowners, we contact them. We'll, we'll leave a message. We'll leave a note on the door for them. And just letting you know that we'll be back first thing in the morning to uh, to finish up that tree. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm going to jump in and say I know we have folks here from around the country, and the laws do vary. Um, so there's like chemical trespassing laws that you need to make sure that you're in compliance with. 
So since we don't know those specifically necessarily for your area, our recommendation at RTSA would be to call your Department of Ag or State EPA if you have any questions around the legality. Um, but then as Paul said, I think generally within the industry, if you know that it's like legal where you live, um, you notify the customer. I know some of the companies that I work with actually have like a form that they have the client sign off on to make sure that they know that it's there and they're not gonna touch it. Um, and then if it's like in a backyard that they would close the gate and make sure that no one was going back there. I've worked with some companies that will like barricade, so they'll tarp it and then they'll like actually have little fencing things or barricades. Um, and then we also have companies who don't leave the batteries um, or pumps. They'll pull all of that, they'll just leave. Um, they'll just, or yeah, so they'll leave the pump and not the battery, but they, so they won't have it on. Um, they just rely on the transpiration of the tree. That way you don't have to worry about springing a leak. Um, you won't have to worry about stuff getting stolen because obviously plastic and tubes, tubes and teas aren't super attractive for theft. Um, but there's a few things to consider. So even though some companies do overnight, some also don't, and that could be for a good reason. What is common maintenance and troubleshooting for your injection equipment? Yeah, uh, common maintenance for us, uh, you know, uh, for us and a lot of troubleshooting stuff revolves uh, a lot around getting air into the system. Uh, it's probably the most common issue we have. Um, you know, the more you use it, sometimes it rattles, you know, open some of the valves or whatever. So for us, really just checking our equipment before each application um, is one of the best ways for us to combat that. And if they need something fixed, you know, we'll, uh, I, they have tools or small tools on them to be able to, to fix that, or I'll come out and, and swap out or, uh, fix it up for them so yeah checking your equipment is definitely the number one I get a lot of troubleshooting questions and most of the time it's because easy stuff like pumps or filters didn't get cleaned or like their o-ring somehow disappeared so just check those things and then again like I'm going to plug for our TSA but we have a bunch of guides on our website that actually walk you through the troubleshooting and then you can always call us and we have someone here who can help walk you through it um, if you're having issues. In your opinion, what is the biggest challenge with tree injection and how do I overcome that challenge? Yeah, so for me and uh, my techs, uh, waiting for a slow tree to finish. Uh, we have trees sometimes that'll take two hours, one hour, 45 minutes, and then we have those certain trees that will take a day, a day and a half, two days sometimes. Um, so uh, we have them bring a book. Uh, you know, we have them limit the phone use. You know, we don't want them to bury their head in the phone. Uh, they need to be present to what they are doing with, you know, if they're wearing earbuds, one in, one out. Uh, you know, in, in training and out on site, we stress that we need to be able to hear what our equipment is doing, but also, you know, having them walk around the tree constantly and, and really not, you know, hang in their chair, you know, they bring chairs to sit in and stuff, but uh, it's just really important to be present. And so I, I think the, for us, that's, it's always a big challenge, but it's really about creating those habits. Yeah, uh, Paul brings up a good point here. I would say this is probably the biggest issue in the industry um, with macro injections. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you develop a protocol around how att your attentiveness with your techs. Um, you definitely want to you know, train them to have as much professionalism as possible. Um, we, when I used to do these, we had a rule where you weren't allowed to be on your phone except for like work emails or work phone calls. And then the rest of the time, you'd have to have like a paperback or better yet, like an ISA book, a PHC book, a CDL book, or like uh, stuff to learn your nods. Uh, so I guess that that's probably, that's good. And then the other biggest challenge I think I face is when technicians can't figure out where to drill. Like there's a lot of finesse around the art and science of setting up the harness. And Paul kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, so just like lots of training with them, which we're going to talk about in just a moment here, um, Paul is specifically, um, but then reassuring them on how to set it up properly to take have the best uptake time, but also to be doing it properly. Um, and Paul works on that within RTC. I work with that uh, within a lot of other tree care companies. So please feel free to let us know if you have specific questions on that. 
What is common maintenance and troubleshooting? I think we already touched on that one. How have you changed your operations around COVID-19? Yeah, so the world has changed. Uh, the new normalcy is a lot different now. Um, we've, you know, we, we've really tried, we used to do crew formations and stuff. We have now for injections, like uh, ELM or macro injections specifically, we used to operate, or operate under crews or a structure under a crew. Uh, now everybody's individual. Um, so, you know, everybody has their own assigned vehicle. Uh, they have their own ejection equipment. Uh, they work individually unless they need to converge on a larger site. And we've also in-house, we've been making hand sanitizer, disinfectants, and trying to create those habits for them to operate safer within this uh, COVID-19 era. And just really, um, having them wipe down their equipment after use and, um, you know, knocking on the client's door, uh, we call now instead of, uh, instead of knocking on the door. And if they do need to use like the homeowner's hose or something, they have disposable gloves where that glove is put on. And that's the only thing they touch is the homeowner's stuff with that glove. And then they switch out gloves. Uh, we're just, we're, it, we can't keep it a hundred percent safe, but we can definitely keep it safer within some of these guidelines that we've, that we've created and new policies. All right, and next section, how to optimize your crews. What is the background for our RTCs, PHC injection technicians? Who do you use for technicians? Full-time PHC techs, interns, stuff like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it really varies, but we use a wide range. Uh, we use some full-time techs. We use, uh, we, we have some, we have quite a few seasonal techs from colleges um, and uh, some people that are just out of high school, you know, and you know, we hire mostly interns, uh, you know, for our injection work. So some of them do get credits for school. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we take a lot of, a lot of people from all different directions and really just create training and, uh, and get them involved with what we're doing. So anybody can be like a computer science degree, but a lot of them are, most of them are related to, to what we are up to here, like within the same industry. I'm going to just mention really quick here. So like, I think this section will be mostly Paul speaking, but keep in mind here, like rainbow tree care, as you heard, has just like an enormous number of trees under protection. So they do hire quite a lot of seasonal uh, interns for their injection work. Most of the tree care companies out there, all of majority of the ones that I work with, um, you may have a few seasonal technicians doing plant health care, um, but most of the time it would ideally be someone who's kind of cross-trained, a full-time person who does plant health care during the spring and summer and then climbs in the fall and winter. Um, I know generally speaking, most tree care companies kind of look for either, you know, one of several things. One, maybe a little bit of related experience or two, uh, two or four year degree in a semi-related field just to show that they're like interested in outdoor stuff. Um, and then general like willingness to learn, which actually I think we had a question about this, but I'm answering it now. Um, there's just a lot of training involved for a full time employee. So it's really hard to invest in someone if, you know, if they're just going to quit. Right. It's like not worth all the time training if you know that they're not going to stay with you. So um, I will let Paul take away most of the rest of the questions. But please note that like the level is a little bit different. What qualities do you look for in a uh, look for to hire a great technician? Yeah, and, and Allison touched on this a little bit. Uh, you know, the tech's willingness to learn, their eagerness, uh, and re reliability, um, but really just their willingness to learn. You know, a lot of these techs that come in have no idea what they're getting into. You know, they, how many of them know that you inject a tree by drilling it and doing all this stuff? So, uh, really, just the willingness is. For me, it's like the biggest thing, and, and you know, that's probably the number one thing that I that I look for. What are the most common areas you need to retrain on with a technician returning for a second season? Yeah, so uh, retraining, uh, we do a lot of updates um, throughout the season. Some things don't change, so we don't do that, but we'll. Um, you know, we'll go through the process again with them, take them out to another training site, get them caught back up. Um, it, 
for some of them, it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, they haven't ridden one for a year and then they're back on with us and, and stuff. So it's just getting them back into the habits and, and back into the flow of it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a lot of the improvement and the retraining for the, for the techs that come back with us. Yeah, and speaking as like my second season now with RTSA coming into, I'm now going in for like the second year of tra hands-on training with some of the same companies, um, keeping in mind that like, yes, you guys have plenty of seasoned veterans, but they've been climbing all winter or maybe they were laid off all winter. So just giving them a brief refresher on, you know, kind of the biology and science of why you do it. Um, and then going through the process hands-on one time is super helpful. Uh, and then always there's, I feel like there's always like one new tech, you know, here and there. So just getting them integrated into that process is, is really helpful. And it's not super labor intensive to get people to spend an hour or two just retraining fog. Kind of like when you go back to climbing in the winter, you're like, oh, I don't remember how to time at climbing knot. Oh, at least <laughs> I felt like that. <laughs> What is Rainbow Tree Care's training program? Yeah, so we, um, yeah, we have a, a, a pretty interesting program. I think we we do an HR onboarding, which usually takes about a day, um, and then the classroom and of the operation, and and really what the background, the history, you know, what they will be doing for the season, um, and that's usually about a day as well. We kind of condense it this year with the virtual training, but. Uh, Field training demos, uh, field training lasts for us. Like all week last week was, for me, it was all field training. Um, I split them up into groups. I try to do as much individual training as I can. And I try to train to the individual uh, more than anything. Cause I think the, not everybody learns well in a group and everybody learns a little bit differently. So I really try to try to learn from them how they learn, if that makes sense. And really just, just kind of, making it easier for them to learn. There's some people out there that need the hands-on stuff. Some can see it and they're ready to go out the door, um, but we'll we'll stick with them all week. And then I'm out there with them all season, uh, just helping them out. Cause they're gonna run into situations that they, that that are new, you know, like whether it's like a really bad root flare or, you know, the tree is half dead or something. And, um, you know, and that's stuff that you can't train on. Um, you know, unless there's experience with that training. So um, I always, oh, go ahead. Paul, uh, just to clarify, your specific job is mostly to deal with those, the training of those inject techs all, all season? Yeah, yep. So I, I'm, uh, I work with all the macro injections, the elms, the oaks, uh, you know, chlorosis treatments, uh, two line chest up or stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm out with them and, you know, and they're in contact with me all the time, so. What training do you provide to your technicians on an annual basis and how long does that training last? Yeah, so uh, the training is actually continued training throughout the season. Um, you know, I'm in charge of these techs. Uh, we do a lot of quality assurance on the check or techs and stuff. And it's really not a way, for, the quality assurance stuff when we check on sites and stuff, it's really not about trying to find something wrong. It's trying to find a way or find something that, you know, if they're not, sure of something or doing something um, we can train them and, and keep them uh, from developing bad habits so it's really just kind of a continued ongoing training uh, throughout the season and i i'm lucky enough to have uh, seasoned uh, experienced techs come back every year um, this year i have six techs that uh, have been here for three seasons and they help me out immensely for the training and stuff and um, and I still work with them and I, I still train them as well throughout the season because they're still running into things that they don't have experience with. But um, it's just really continued training and, and being with them. And, uh, you know, and, and as a in my position, I think it's really important to be able to learn from those techs so that way it helps you teach them. So I, I think it's just not me speaking all the time, but it's really trying to listen to them and, and how they learn. So. Yeah, you also have a very unique um, job. I would say majority of tree care companies that I work with are just a few technicians, maybe like one coordinator or manager. So like a plant health care manager, or a plant health care coordinator. And they'll do, they're usually the more seasoned tech, uh, you know, several years of experience. They'll spend, you know, a few weeks in the field with, with plant health care techs, but, you know, newer ones. 
Um, but I guess the other thing to keep in mind is like your injection focus. Most plant health care techs are doing everything, sprays, furs, injections. So it's like a lot to learn. So having like a really solid plant health care coordinator who can really devote, you know, a bit of time to get the training, you know, is going to help long run, even though you're like taking away from production by having two people out on a singular, you know, ash injection, say, it will pay off in the long run if you can if you can get those people trained up and feeling really confident and uh, comfortable with that stuff. But yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a good point. It's really creating a, a an environment for them to not be afraid of asking questions and uh, feeling like they're doing something wrong all the time. Um, you know, and then they're there to work and they're there to enjoy the summer and and really the, it's kind of like. Uh, uh, I always look at it as a like a life. They're learning life lessons here too. You know, some have never had a job before, and um, some have no idea how to you know use a drill. And so, and even just like through like the DOT stuff, like learning and you know how to you know uh, check their vehicle for things that they need to check. You know, so they're and uh, you know some of the other things too is learning how to lead your other techs you know we have leads in this division where they have to help out other techs and so they're really learning how to stand up and lead and and how to you know interact with other people as as a lead versus just an individual so um there's a lot of different aspects to it um but uh i think the biggest thing is creating those habits you know the structure and um and just yeah listening to them is is really one of the biggest things the hard part, though, too, I will add, is that um, there's not always a lot of time. So trying to find that time and stuff is uh, that can be difficult. So especially when it's such a short season. What is the scope of Rainbow Tree Care's operations? Number of techs, number of services offered, what type of vehicles, and how many vehicles? Yeah, currently in 2020. Um, we're running with 15 macro techs that uh, are doing elm injections, oak injections throughout the season, uh, or for our micro injections, uh, so it would be ash borer treatments. They're looking at about 40 to 50 techs currently right now um, for the entire season. They'll probably inject until, I'd say, second week of September, maybe, at the most. Um, so, yeah, we have, uh, we have quite a few techs. We rent um, like vans for uh, the injection techs because uh, you know, they have larger barrels, they use deionizer tanks um, and a lot of equipment with that. Where the micro uh, techs uh, or the ash borer techs, they will uh, actually have like rental cars and smaller vehicles, so. It's a lot, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> How does a typical injection crew operate? What time is their first job? Do you prefer they start as far out from the shop as possible than work back in or vice versa? Yeah, so uh, for the macro injections, uh, our current operations have changed from years prior. You know, currently techs are all individual. Uh, we do have a lead structure, but it's still more individualized. Um, but we have about five to six leads with them uh, and two techs assigned to each lead. And then uh, the lead will actually receive the work in the morning via uh, email. So everybody has a tablet now, everything. We were kind of forced with the COVID thing to go from paper to paperless. So everybody has a tablet. We use GIS systems and uh, email to be able to deliver some of that stuff. And then we're using uh, another uh, app, like a survey one, two, three, I believe, to do like a, a work order. So that way we can keep track and, and really keep that. Um, you know, and the lead receives those works in a packet. Uh, usually it's, I don't know, about 30 trees or 30 job sites. And they'll have those for probably four to five days sometimes. Uh, Multi-tree sites, so those those techs will actually converge a little bit and work together to to get those trees up and going. You know, when you're dealing with like the three, four, five tree sites, it can be a lot of work. And they don't have all that much of equipment. They have two to three setups, you know, per vehicle. So. Um, yeah, but they'll come in um, right around 7.15 in the morning. Uh, we do a, um, you know, and, and then right about 7.30 is when they get, you know, start rolling out for the day, you know, so. Yeah, and industry-wide, uh, kind of to answer this question, it says like, whatever, like, where do you prefer they start? 
I think it just kind of depends on your volume. I know, you know, my old office was only protecting a few hundred trees every year. So we would kind of get them all together, organize them by kind of location, and then just kind of whittle, whittle through them. If there was only max, maybe five or six of us doing injections at a time. So we could breeze through those pretty quickly. So you're just looking at a little bit of a different volume. But if you can, I think, what this is suggesting, like either starting further away from the shop and then moving back in is really smart if you can do that. Um, but really just depends on kind of your volume and location of, of your trees. Yeah, and that's a good point, Allison. We um, we will start as far as way as we can and work our way back. And so I think that um, for when you're dealing with like traffic and you know, the traffic levels have been really low lately, but um, there's still traffic out there, you know, and drive time. So trying to get them out there earlier and then, you know, at the end of the day, they don't have as far to go, which is- Sure, uh, Paul, I did uh, my majority of my injections in Chicago city limits proper. So we know a lot about traffic here. <laughs> All right, so what does a typical day look like for a technician? Yeah, so uh, here at Rainbow, uh, they come in, start you know going through their vehicle right away. They clock in on their uh, on their phone on an ADP app. Uh, they sign out their product. Uh, we bring it out in a crate for them, and uh, everything is organized uh, for that. If they need any more PPE, it's on that crate, uh, tablets, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do a safety meeting every morning, and it lasts about five to ten minutes uh, tops. You know, I, I I pick up on things that you know went right or wrong for the techs the day before or something else that happened within our company. Um, you know, yesterday, the last couple of days, we've had some pretty significant wins. So one of the topics was, you know, inspecting your tree. We already inspect our tree, but um, now they're looking for not only disease, but anything that broke out like hangers or uh, anything that could potentially fall on them while they're working on the tree, because we've had some heavy winds for the last two days. Um, so just really things like that. Um, the, the ultimate goal for, you know, for the techs is to to bring them back safely every day. Um, so I, I really, the safety meeting is a great touch base every morning before they go out. Um, and it, it really empowers them too to ask questions in front of everybody because some people have those questions and they don't ask them. So um, for that, it's it's really nice. But yeah, well, anything relevant for the day we'll talk about. And then uh, from there, they just go out and, you know, site to site and just start their day. So I'm going to just jump in really quick here and say uh, that is not what a most tree care company operations look like. <laughs> like when you were like, oh, they have they sign out all this stuff and it's like an organized little line of crates being brought out. Um, <laughs> my old shop and almost every shop that I've been to is a little bit more like chickens with their heads cut off running around. Um, maybe there was organization within like what jobs you were going to do the day before, you know, routed the day before for you. but um realistically i feel like it ends up being more like a shuffle from truck to truck and like not sure what equipment they need and then of course like when i was a sales arborist i'd get a call like i don't have a xyz that you definitely should have needed to have so um i think the goal eventually for all tree care companies is to get to that point where it is really organized you figure out how much chemical you need they check it out they sign everything out whatever but um realistically just try to be as organized as you potentially can be um, and you'll figure out the systems that work for yourselves, uh, especially as your operations begin to grow. But um, I, I guess I just wanted to jump in and say, don't feel guilty if your operation does not look like what Paul just described. Yeah, it's it's gotten better. Like I, this is my 14th season uh, in this position. And um, so I, I definitely, when I started out, it wasn't as organized. And it was, <laughs> like the chicken with its head cut off running around. Um, it, it took a lot of time to get to this point and um, really see what works and what doesn't. And bringing in these seasonal techs too, I think it's, it's important to keep them and organized and then show them the organization as well. Cause then that way they, they're, it's more structured for them. It's easier for them to operate and they, they kind of have a better uh, organization with their vehicle and chemical, their process um, out in the field and stuff, so. I think you touched on this one a little bit earlier, but how many kit setups should a tech have? Yeah, it, this uh, for for Rainbow, what we're doing uh, this year, each tech has about two to three elm setups. You know, the barrel, the pump, uh, about seventy-five T's per barrel. Um, you know, and the oak techs, uh, 
they have those manual pumps, uh, and so they have about six of those per per tech as well. And in each oak tech is also set up with elm equipment if they're doing multi trees on the same site, so they can do an elm and oaks or you know vice versa. So. Yeah, uh, I would say though, generally speaking, an average tree care company probably only has a few setups each. Um, maybe if you have a big municipal contractor, like a huge volume, then then maybe several. But mm -hmm. I'd say my average company probably only has three or four setups total. But I've not met everyone either. <laughs> <laughs> What is the average time for uptake for a macro injection? Yeah, so this this can vary uh, quite a bit. Uh, for us, uh, right around one to four hours, um, you know, and it, it just really depends on uh, on the tree and the setup and stuff. But uh, if, for the actual injection time, um, yeah, one to four hours. Okay, so ideally, uh, we, I mean, and you guys treat so many, Paul, you, I mean, you have a much, much broader variety of this, but I would say when I go out to do these trainings to just make sure that we're kind of like up on all of the protocols and doing everything as perfectly as possible, ideally the uptake time, once you turn on that pump to full uptake, we would like to get you down to closer to two hours or less. So if you are having consistent problems above two hours for uptake time, please call us and let us know. And then keep in mind that that doesn't necessarily include travel, root flare excavation, harness setup, water, anything you need to do the water, dosing, um, stuff like that. Um, and then I guess just wanna add quickly for like iron or manganese injections um, or sycamore anthracnose injections, those could be way, way, way slower. Um, like doing a maple with manganese could take the whole day. Um, with regularity, so that this is a little bit dependent on, on things. All right, uh, what are some tips and tricks that you have learned over the years to maximize uptake of systemic products? Yeah, uh, that's a good segue from the last question. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, making sure you have enough injection sites. Um, you know, I, I've seen people where they spread out their injection sites and stuff, um, and it's really, the injection sites is really key. It's probably one of the most important things uh, that we're that we're doing in the application process. You know, you don't want to drill too deep. That's also really important to get good distribution. Yes, yes. You know, you don't want to drill too deep. Uh, you know, and pass the current uh, current year's uh, xylem as well. You know, uh, but in some cases, though, you got to get creative. You know, not every tree is going to be the same setup. Sometimes, um, there all these trees are going to be in unique spots too. So um, you need to be willing to, you know, challenge yourself and figure out, you know, how that tree is really asking you to inject it. You know, the when you're excavated the root flare and you see that root flare, um, it'll tell you, you know, where they want the injection sites and how it wants to be set up. Um, you know, and, and you know, sometimes it's harder to to see that, but um, you know, you just have to really listen for it and and uh, you know, it kind of maps it out for you when you're looking at the root flare. Um, what I would say too is we specifically have a material built around a marketing material built around this, the seven pitfalls to macro infusion. So over the years, our TSA has collected data, um, kind of from all of our clients, and the the top seven issues that we see when we're having slow uptake time. Make sure your drill bits are sharp. Make sure you are cleaning off the root flare. Make sure you are setting your T's the proper depth. Um, make sure that the injection is happening in the root flare to the best of the capacity. Um, checking for clogged T's. If they're filled with dirt, they're not going to do anything. Clean your pump filter and make sure you've got the right water. So if you want a copy of that sheet that we have, it also has the dosing thing, holler at us. Um, but I think that's really, those are the seven things that we notice to try to maximize that uptake time. All right, moving on to the next section, sales conversations. And I will just give everyone a little heads up. We do have a 10 minute warning right now. And how to get started selling the Dutch elm disease treatments. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of take on this section a bit, but Paul jump in uh, if you see anything. But basically like if you are already doing plant health care or tree care, um, and you know there is Dutch elm disease in your area, you know that you have American elms in your area, 
start to learn about Dachshund disease, start to learn about Arbitect and the preventative treatment around it. Um, you can refer to a lot of our stuff online, like I said, treecarescience.com. Um, and then call us, talk to your TM, your arborologist. And then once you're like comfortable with the concept, this is this true for all plant healthcare or anything. Once you're comfortable and you understand how things work, um, pitching that to your clients as you see it is going to become really easy and second nature. And then the number one sales thing, if you don't propose it, they will never accept it, right? So propose a Dutch elm disease treatment on every site that you've got with an American elm where there's Dutch elm disease in the area. And that's how you start. And then it gets much easier as you, as you go. How do you advertise and sell work? Okay, so Rainbow has a pretty big marketing team. Um, they do mailings, flyers, emails, informational materials, like the whole, like a lot of you already get a lot of stuff from us. Um, we provide you with pest updates and stuff like that. But um, we also do this for our, on our RTC side to our clients. So those are lots of different options. There's also like opportunities to change things within search engines, you come up higher on the top of the list in a Google search, all sorts of online marketing. And then of course, like social media, is such a big thing. Um, our marketing team deals with that a lot, but Facebook and Instagram, I think are like the biggest ones right now, but there's lots of, lots of different ways to do it. And I think it just kind of depends on your capacity for it. Is it more cost-effective to buy expansion teas or a second system? Okay, so that's actually a really good question because we didn't talk about replacing your equipment. Um, if you need new tubes and tees, you most likely also need a new pump um, because those pumps are really only designed to last maybe, and Paul, you can speak to this, but maybe five-ish years. Um, and honestly, the tubes and tees are probably starting to show pretty crappy wear by that time as well. Um, but just for a pricing standpoint to answer this question, Tubes and tees, a set of replacement tubes and tees are about $125. The whole macro kit with the pump, the tubes and tees and everything will run you about 500. But Paul, five-ish years, how long do you keep your pumps? Yeah, um, it, it really depends. So I think the the lifespan is like 3,000 hours or something like mm, that. Okay. Something like that. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, and it really depends on the usage too. Um, we use ours super heavy, so it's usually not close to five years, but some, sure. some of them I've had for, you know, six, seven years, depending on like, you know, I've had to fix them several times, but yeah. Sure. So if you're having like slow uptake and you've had your pump around for a while, you, you may just want to replace the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I've tried, I've tried replacing the diaphragms in those pumps and uh, it, it never was the same uh, for the, once you get into the nuts and bolts inside the pump itself. Good to know. What should I be charging for an injection application? Okay, so um, again, this kind of goes back to what type of injection, um, macro injection I'll speak to, uh, well, actually micro I'll speak to really quickly. Micro injections are a lot quicker, a lot more, a lot easier, a lot more predictable, I feel. Um, industry standards really kind of depends, but I'd say if you're kind of in that like 10 to $12 per inch, uh, range, you're probably about in, in the middle of, with the middle of the pack. Um, you could go lower if you've got a bigger contract, or you could go higher if you've got like higher overhead costs um, or like higher value properties, stuff like that. But, but gauge your market, because I know we've got some smaller cities, but also bigger cities, and that will impact you. Um, but then for macro injection, uh, generally speaking in the industry, I would say maybe about 16 to $20 an inch. Um, and again, you could go less if there was more, uh, more trees to be done at one property because you're saving yourself the travel time, um, but maybe a bit more if it was kind of like a pain in the butt site or a pain in the butt tree. Um, I personally think, um, so we can send you a specific, like we have a pricing Excel sheet that we can send you that we could help you to determine the charges that you need to charge. Um, and those would be based on like your overhead costs, your travel time and your ROIs, like your ideal ROIs. Um, but to me, once you look at that, uh, I think it's best to determine your price per inch cost um, just to cover your bases for a slow tree versus a fast tree, kind of like land somewhere in the middle. So you're 
making money but not like totally overcharging or undercharging and losing your shirt um, and then once you find that kind of sweet spot stick to that price per inch um, just because it's much easier to explain to your clients and your technicians and stuff like that but again a little bit arbitrary a little bit of finesse finesse there all right thank you paul and allison and with that, we'll open it up. We got about five minutes left if anyone has any additional questions to this. Otherwise, if we don't uh, make it to your question that you type into the chat box, uh, you can send it to info at treecarescience.com or type it into the chat box and we'll have someone reach out to you. Uh, if you do want any other additional technical support, diagnostic guides, product questions, equipment troubleshooting, um, or you wanna set up a training session with your territory manager, feel free to reach out best way possible for you, phone, text, email, or live chat on our website. And with that, we'll see if we got any questions in here. All right, don't look like we have any through here. Um, give it a couple more seconds. All right, well, I don't think any of you will complain about getting out a few minutes early. Oh, one more second. Could you share the seven pitfalls of macro injection and Excel pricing sheet with me? Not a problem. We'll get that sent out to you once we get this back into our office. So you should probably see that maybe later today, if not uh, early tomorrow. So with that, we'll give you a couple minutes back of your day. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you found this information valuable. And thank you to Paul and Allison for taking the time out of their day um, to share all this good information. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Happy injecting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.